That doesn't happen with cardiac muscle. And the reason for that is because of the long duration of the action. Your action potentials are a couple hundred milliseconds, and because of that, tension is already starting to decrease before you get to the point specifically action potential. Absolute refractory behavior means that you cannot get any new action potential. You can't stimulate that cell again, no matter what stimulus you get, no matter how strong it is or how intense it is. The relative refractory period, on the other hand, this is the period in which you can technically reset, but you need a much stronger signal. It's either going to be a higher intensity or it has to be a longer duration. Okay? The relative refractory period means you are capable of stimulating that, that muscle cell to contract a second time, but you need a much stronger stimulus before you can actually. The total refractory period, by definition, means that that muscle effectively can't be stimulated. It absolutely can during that absolute refractory period. The relative refractory period simply requires a much stronger signal to overcome the effectiveness of that muscle cell. Okay? And these are correlating with what's happening right after you initiate the tractile force and during the until you can repolarize that action control far enough down to reset those voltage gated sodium channels, to make them active again, you can't stimulate another action. That's where the big issue is. Okay? Not all of them are going to reestablish their activity at the same time, but they will all hover around the same voltage. That voltage is around that. Start to open a few at more negative potentials. But that negative 70 threshold inside your cardiac muscle is typically that threshold by which the fast voltage of sodium channels are going to open up to allow it to sodium and that upstream. Once they become inactive, the potential has to drop down below that threshold again so that the inactivation gate can be released and the activation gate can open up again. For those of you that took Bible 3, that'll be convenient. You don't need to know the specifics about activation and activation gate for this class, but you do need to understand that your sodium channels are the ones that are responsible for that. <laughs> then, because the calcium channels stay open for a long time, they prolong that period where you are in that more positive voltage, ensuring that your fast voltage your sodium channels can't be continued. Okay? So that's really what's responsible for your absolute and relative refractory period. All right. So, <coughs> quick question. Um, yeah, it's only three children. Don't worry if you don't know what a voltage channel experiment is. Um, if you are in 504 for the first time without having 503, you might not know what this is unless you've worked in a lab. <coughs> we do go through this. Uh, clearly in 503. But the question I want to ask you is, with a basic understanding that voltage clamp experiments allow you to study individual membrane transport, membrane channels that are voltage gated, by locking in that membrane at a specific voltage and then seeing what kind of current is going to flow in response to that voltage. So like if you start at resting membrane, you can actually set the membrane voltage to a more depolarized level that's sub threshold and then above threshold and see what happens to the overall current. Is sodium, potassium, calcium, are they moving in or out of the cell or are they moving at all? That'll give you an indication about whether or not you can open. Okay. So in this case, we're looking at <coughs> isoproteranol, which is an analog of epinephrine. You add that to a cardiac myocyte in a voltage plant experiment, you see an increase in calcium. What would happen if you were to block that particular channel?
Why would you do that? What is this particular compound doing? Specifically, what is it going to do with that cell? It's going to, yeah, it's going to slow down. It's actually going to shorten your plateau. Because anytime you add an AZ blocker, you add it in a value that's not going to kill the action cell, you are likely going to inactivate or block multiple channels that are on the chart. So remember, you have a ton of So you have to pay attention to the degree to which you add water. What this is really going to do is it is going to shut down the amount of calcium that can come inside the cell. If it can shut down the amount of calcium coming inside the cell, then it's going to shorten that plateau of the action. Also going to reduce the amount of calcium available for form for fueling that property. Why do we care about calcium coming in from the outside? So we do have storage. We have a sarcoplasm particular which is filled the brain with calcium waiting to be released. But Cardiac muscle, as with smooth muscle, you need to have calcium from the outside or calcium due calcium release. It's not required for skeletal muscle, but it is required for smooth and for cardiac. <laughs> so this is from, uh, I believe, the Burn Levy book. But it'll give you a good indication of what is actually happening at that tissue built inside of your cardiac. This uh, action potential on the top is showing what is going on at the different points of activation or electrical stimulation of that cell. <clears throat> so if we start with our sodium channels coming in, which is not shown, you have your fast voltage gated sodium channels responsible for that action. You have potassium channels that are responsible for that mild dip in voltage, and then you have these guys. This calcium channel. That is going to be responsible for allowing calcium to come in. It's an L type calcium channel in your ventricles. Also, great. It's actually in all of your muscle cells, but it's the one that is in your muscle. On another type of So, this is your L type calcium that's responsible for that calcium induced calcium. Calcium coming in will then promote the release of more calcium from that sarcoplasm. Now, because I had said before that our cardiac muscle is similar in terms of overall anatomy, it's striated like skeletal muscle, it utilizes troponin and tropomyosin to regulate calcium, <coughs> uh, I guess calcium induction of phosphorus cycling. You might wonder how this is different from what you see in skeletal muscle. In skeletal muscle, your L type calcium channel is your dihydroperiodic vessel. On your sarcoplasm reticulum, you have a rhyanidine receptor, which is also called a calcium release. The big difference between the two is that both of those channels are in different isotopes. Uh, this is from a paper from Cold Press Cover, and I think it's just But it shows you. Skeletal muscle on the left hand side and then cardiac muscle on the right hand side. I will upload You have the DHTR, which is your voltage gated calcium in type in skeletal muscle. And there's a different isoform in cardiac The same thing holds true for the rhyanidine receptor. You have rhyanidine one that stays in your skeletal muscle, you have rhyanidine two that stays in cardiac muscle. There's also a rhyanidine receptor. Um, that's typically the brain one. But for our purposes, we're looking at right one, right? Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> the biggest difference between these two sets with the different isoforms is that the voltage gated calcium and the ryanine receptor in one in the cell muscle are mechanically coupled. So it doesn't matter if any calcium comes in from the outside, it's not necessary. As soon as it's stimulated to open, it yanks open and allows that's not the case for cardiac. They're not mechanically linked in the same way. When that voltage gated L-type calcium is stimulated, <coughs> calcium comes in, and that calcium coming in is what stimulates the ryanine 2 receptor to open up to release the intracellular stores. You still need those intracellular stores to get contraction in cardiac. The difference is how it's so, skeletal muscle is mechanical, it's just they're physically coupled together. In cardiac, they're not. There's typically a one to one relationship between the voltage gated calcium channel and the right receptor, where one of them will stimulate the other just in terms of proximity. But for all intents and purposes, the calcium coming in from the outside and being present in the sarcoplasm is, which is the cytoplasm of your. Sorry, the myoplasm is the cytoplasm inside of your muscle cell, is what stimulates the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release that calcium. Any yes. So, is the calcium actually binding to the ryanodine receptor? Okay. You typically have low levels in the cytoplasm, so there's not enough there to routinely keep it open. Gotcha. And plus, the circle working away. You need to open it and kind of put it in the outside so that it can interact with the right and the So it's more like a physical. So the, the calcium from um, the other receptor comes into the cytoplasm to 1.2. What are we looking at cardiac? Yes. Okay, so we're talking about here? No, on the other. On the yes. side. Yes. Yeah, it's coming into the cytoplasm and it will bind to mm -hmm. it'll interact with this right and receptor open it up and release all the calcium. You can get some calcium coming in from the exercise material and some that's coming in from the But you have a lot more inside the OR. So that would release that and not have to <coughs> Any other questions about the difference? <coughs> <clears throat> you actually, so that was discovered in Pyramid. They took purified skeletal muscle and they looked at what would happen if you came to concentration and actually removed all calcium from the outside of the cell in the beta tobacco solution. And they found that if you electrically stimulated it so that those two things open, even if there was no calcium outside the cell to go in, it didn't matter because the interest <coughs> was So that was one of their. Um, Indicators that there was a mechanical linkage, so that all you had to do was signal the L-type channels to open up, and basically, when it opened, it sort of yanked open the right. We're talking about that, but for context, the important takeaway here is that you need calcium coming in through that L-type channel in order to get calcium to leave the cell, too, because they are different. So I, I'll probably put the whole thing on as well, but I will extract the one figure. It's an interesting read for anybody that's curious about muscle biology. <clears throat> okay. So once your calcium gets released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it can bind to the troponin complex. Again, the details of the troponin binding are with review. You just need to know that calcium binds to troponin in general and initiates contraction. When that happens, it will bind to allow it to move tropomyosin for cross membrane tension. You can actually get tension being developed once you have calcium 
in through the outside of the cell and then <coughs> simulating that relationship. Any questions on this so far? Okay. The next thing I want to talk about, we mentioned this before, typically talking about beta adrenergic receptors being G protein coupled receptors. They do have an effect on the heart instead of the uh, beta 2 adrenergic receptors we talked about, about last semester. They are beta 1 adrenergic receptors that we have present in the heart. This is one of the ways in which you can have the autonomic nervous system have some control over your overall heart rate. Because we're looking at compounds that are binding to a receptor that's going to activate each new protein, the effects of that binding can last for minutes to hours to days, depending on the <coughs> strength of that binding and if there's any signal that feeds back to shut off. This is showing what happens when you activate uh, adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase will cause this guy right here. Adenyl cyclase will cause the cleavage of ATP and AMP. Cyclic AMP binds to regulatory units on PKA. So there are two catalytic centers of two regulatory units. <clears throat> and your cyclic AMP is going to bind with regulatory units on PKA. Move them, change the structure, and now your catalytic units off and phosphorylate a whole bunch of different targets. Some of those targets that we're looking start here, your catecholamine. They're going to bind to that beta adrenergic receptor. Elevated levels of sigma DMP will allow that protein kinase A to phosphorylate a number of different targets. One of those targets is going to be troponin I. Normally, that exerts effect on the ability to bind calcium. So if you phosphorylate that, you remove that information. It promotes the ability of calcium to bind to <coughs> which speeds up the rate at which contraction is achieved. The other thing that catecholamines are going to do is they are also going to phosphorylate that L-type voltage-gated calcium. It gets phosphorylated. It increases the probability that it's open, which means you are increasing the chances that you have calcium coming in, and therefore that calcium can activate the rank receptor on your cell. Another indicator that's going to promote the initiation of contraction. Two phosphorylation targets of PKA, induced by that beta adrenergic signaling, <clears throat> will give you the initiation of contraction at a faster rate. What's an example of catecholamine? Epinephrine, norepinephrine, so which autonomic system is that? Sympathetic. Okay. What does sympathetic do? It's fight or flight. So what does it do to heart rate? Okay. So these are two of the ways that you're going to get it to be simulated to track. <coughs> However, if you want to increase your overall heart rate, you can't just stimulate it to contract that. You also have to stimulate it to relax that. Because you're trying to increase the turnover of contraction and relaxation so that that can happen more quickly. So the other target, which I already had a little arrow drawn here, this arrow is pointing out phospholamine. <clears throat> Normally, it is the phosphorylated state. is able to inhibit surface. It has a slight, sort of like a breaking effect on surface. It slows it. doesn't mean it stops it entirely, but it does slow it down so that it doesn't rapidly turn over. When you induce this beta adrenergic signal, the third type of phosphorylation that I want to talk about is <clears throat> this particular protein. Phospholamban, when it gets phosphorylated, basically relieves that inhibition to allow CERCA to kind of kick in behind it. CERCA stands for sarcoplasmic and endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATP, okay, S-E-R-C-A. That is an ATP hydrolysis uh, fuel pump to pump calcium from the cytoplasm back into the sarcoplasmic. 
So if the circus job is to remove calcium from the cytoplasm, what does it have a role in? Right, you have to have calcium in order to get your <coughs> So remove calcium from the cytoplasm. <coughs> Okay, so two phosphorylation sites that stimulate contraction, the L-type calcium channel and your DHPR, and your opponent I, which is the inhibitory subunit of the epithelial complex. Both of those promote calcium not only coming into the cytoplasm, but also being able to bind to your opponent to promote cross the cytoplasm. So contraction is muscle lamb band is relaxation. When that gets phosphorylated, it increases the rate at which calcium, once it shows up in the cytoplasm, can become back. These together are going to increase your overall heart rate because you have a faster initiation of depression and a faster initiation of relaxation. That's going to increase the overall number of weeks. Think about that. Yeah. Any questions? <coughs> okay. So what do you think would happen if phospholipid just all the time? <laughs> it might not be stimulated to contract faster, but it relaxes the body. So the loss of tension will happen. So will what in terms of um, the, the heart rate is going on. It's the relaxation side. Going to lose the tension faster. If you're losing the tension faster, what might that do to the body? Okay. Okay. Right, so this relaxing faster than the normal time. What if you were to inactivate circum? Calcium gets into the myoplasm and there's no functioning circuit in that cell at all. It's up there for a Ready to look up to the right? You have another way to get calcium to the cell. Because you <coughs> can do the bulk of your work, don't get me wrong. So it will inhibit the ability of your calcium to get out of the cytoplasm and stick around longer, which is going to increase the duration of compression. Okay, and increase the strength of it. But there are other channels that are in the plasma membrane. Right? That are capable of removing calcium from that. You have a calcium ATPase, the so hydrolysis of ATP that fuels the ejection of calcium from the body, or from the body, not the body. <laughs> and you have a sodium calcium exchanger that will basically exploit the potential energy of sodium coming in to fuel the ejection of calcium. So it would increase strength of contraction, it would increase. Um, the duration of interaction potentials, the duration of that contraction, but it doesn't mean that it would be a permanent. Yes. <coughs> yeah, if you inhibited fossil land band, normally fossil land band's job is to slow down. So if you got rid of that, it just means that in the absence of any kind of stimulation, there would be effectively no calcium. <coughs> In the cytoplasm. So, for normal cellular function, the removal of all calcium from the cytoplasm could have consequences just for normal subcellular function. But it also means that um, even in the absence of sympathetic stimulation, you would have rapid re sequestration of that, uh, that calcium into the cytoplasm. So, it wouldn't stay in the cytoplasm. As long as normal, in order to maintain that cross personal If you lost circa, circa is the big, it's pulling most of the weight for 
getting the cytoplasm cleared of calcium, but there are fallbacks. There are those two channels that are up in the plasma membrane that are capable of removing that calcium. So you can still get calcium away and you can still relax that muscle to stop that tension in the generator by getting calcium out. It's just that now it's going to all come out of the cytoplasm and go in the extra fluid instead of the Which means the next time you stimulate the contract, all the calcium you get is kind of compression. <coughs> All right. Any other questions? Okay, so now we're going to talk specifically about the electrical events of your cardiac cycle. So this will be the introduction to a lot of the stuff that's happening for what we're going to talk about next in terms of your ECG, which we'll do on Tuesday. But this will lead through all of the electrical events that are happening, not just the different types of action potentials, but also the directionality of the polarization of the heart, which will come into play when we talk about the cardiac action. <coughs> so we have three main case-making types of fibers. These are specialized fibers inside of the heart that are there to form your conduction. So you have conduction fibers and you have contractile fibers. Your conduction fibers are part of the system. Start with the sinoatrial node, then you have heading down through internodal pathways and across into the left atrium, down to the atrioventricular node or the AV node. From there, the fibers will pass through the interventricular septum and down the left and right bundle branches, radiating out into the circulation system, which is responsible for conduction stimulus of ventricular dysfunction. Okay? All of these <clears throat> are there to initiate and spread contraction, um, the electrical signal for contraction, in one direction. So it should come from your right atrium and spread down to the <coughs> Your SA sinoatrial node is one patient. Your AV node, your ventricular node, is another patient. Your Pitchy system is another patient. All of these are capable of self activation, auto depolarization. Because they can activate themselves, they, in theory, could fire and stimulate every other cell in the heart. So you have a couple of backups. Your SA node is going to royally mess with the way your heart works, but it's not with itself. Okay? Why is it that stimulation of any one of these pacemaker cells is going to spread so quickly? Every other cell inside the heart. Gap junction. I heard it. I didn't even said it, but I heard it. Gap junction. Very um, low resistance in between the cells so that any cell that is stimulated with current is going to be able to pass through all of the other cells around it. <clears throat> so, this is actually an action. Looks different than what we've seen before, mainly because there are no voltages in the sodium chain. Those are the ones that are responsible for that really fast upshoot. And then they inactivate very quickly. In this case, we have different channels that are functioning. We do have sodium moving in through a different type of channel. The resting potential of your SA node is <coughs> more depolarized, it's a less negative number than the rest of the potential. Ballpark, what was ventricular pressure? 85, negative 85. Okay. We're looking at negative 60. Okay. So, at rest, at your resting potential, one thing that I will point out in a little bit again is that you see this, it's a, oops, sorry. 
a very mild <coughs> slope. of one of the types of currents. We're going to have four different currents that we're going to talk about. So they're going to move and be responsible for these weak making currents. So that depolarization happens at rest. And resting potentials in these case making cells, they have the expression of channels that are open at that value, which means <coughs> you have a slow peak of sodium and calcium coming into the cell even when the cells are rest. So that's what's called your diastolic depolarization. <laughs> even when the cells are rest, it's slowly creeping up. That's the basis for its ability to auto depolarize and initiate itself. Have an you still have to cross threshold in order to open the other. Mainly your L-type. <coughs> okay. Your sodium coming in, is one type of channel that actually a little bit of You also have that other type of calcium channel. Remember what type that was? We have L type that's in everything. And then we also have your T type calcium channels are active or open, have the probability of being open between negative 80 millivolts and about negative 20 millivolts. So some of them are going to be open at this resting membrane. Your L-type calcium channels tend to be active between negative 30 millivolts and positive 30 millivolts. So once you actually have an action potential, those T-type calcium channels may shut down because you cross over its upper limit for being able to react. That's where your L-type calcium channels are really responsible for the bulk of the work. All right. One thing I want to point out here, I'm going to show five different slides that show these, what the action potentials look like in different parts of the heart, so that you can see them up close. And then I'm going to show you one, has, the actual figure is one of them all lined up. You can see specifically the timing of these ones. So let's first take a quick look at your slow action potential. That slow action potential shows that you have this leak occurring during <coughs> that resting. This is your diastolic That is because of the movement of sodium leaking in the, in the cell and some calcium leaking in the cell. Okay, so that's your sodium leak. Your, sorry, that's supposed to be a two. You forget to. Um, your slow calcium channels are going to open. So at rest, you have this sodium, well, it's a non selective channel that allows sodium to move into the cell. And you have your T type calcium channel that can be active at that point. At this point, once you hit that threshold, you're around negative 40, negative 30, you can start opening those slow voltage gated L type calcium channels. Those are responsible for. The upshoot and the it's not really the last one. It's not really the last one. When you get to the top of that peak, the passing channels have been now stimulated to open and they're going to be responsible for the Okay? So if you compare your slow wave to your fast wave to what you call the muscle, this is what they would look like. Start at a much lower resting limit <coughs> and you go to a higher peak action potential voltage because of that voltage gate is not present in slow wave. It has to do with the expression of different channel types in different types of cells. Okay, your pacemaking cells have it's actually called the front because it's active and fast. So atrial muscle will look similar to ventricular muscle. Your AV node has that similar slow wave that you see 
with the work of these making cells. The biggest difference is that your Purkinje fibers do look similar to what you see in ventricular muscle. The big difference there is you still have this guy. It's not super strong. It's a slow and steady increase, but you do still have that funny current that allows the sodium to leak in and some calcium to leak in when you're at rest, even though that resting potential is more negative than your SA. So it is capable of triggering itself to polarize and cause natural potential, which can spread. That'll become important. Ventricular muscle is flat at resting, so you don't have what we saw before, and it's the same one that we've been talking about. Why do you have to have it go through the AV node? Why don't you just get the atria stimulating the ventricle? So, I think pretty much everybody got the, the main reason for new directional flow and also the timing of the device. You don't get contraction of the ventricles and the time. But there's one specific anatomical reason. That ring is the fiber, is the fiber strength around the atrium that basically functions as a anatomical. So that all current that comes down through those systems passes past through there because there's no other way for it to get through from the internet to the ventricle. Okay? That AV ring ensures that everything passes through that AV node to control the directionality and timing of current conduction throughout the heart. So this is what I was talking about. <laughs> there are five, those five figures that I showed before all lined on top of each other so you can see the sequential stimulation of the electrical activity. The SA node fires first, which stimulates the atrial muscle, which then reaches the AV node, and then transfers down through the Pinji system, and then the Pinji system. So the timing of it, there's not a huge delay, but there's enough of a delay so that you get coordinated contraction of the two upper chambers and two lower chambers so that the blood can flow in the direction. In terms of current specifically, you guys remember Holmes Law from here? V equals IR. Okay, voltage equals your current times the distance, or your current equals your voltage over the distance. So, what we're looking at here is anytime you get positive charges, that ionic current that's coming into the cell, it's going to flow through that cell to the neighboring cell. <coughs> Because of this feature, so this is your own. Okay? We're 
we're looking at cell A and cell B, the relative resistance between the two cells is what? High or low? Low. So what does that mean? So very low resistance. So your current passing through, these gap junctions are very minimal barriers. When you stimulate one cell, it passes directly into the neighboring cell, so it spreads very quickly, which is what you want in order to get the possible to pack all this one. All right, here are your major cardiac members. <coughs> We've already talked a little bit about your sodium current, your calcium current, your potassium current. We haven't talked about your pacemaker current, which is also called your funny current, that's why it's the IF. Right? It's funny. Because we don't expect there to be an influx of sodium at rest. Okay? That's not found in pretty much all the other cells in the body. It's found in the because of a special type of channel that is open at that rest assembly. Okay? So what it looks like when we're looking again at these current flows, so this one actually does a good job of showing you that. Below that dashed line is inward, okay, and above is outward. <coughs> when we look at the funny current, that funny current is showing <coughs> even when you're in that phase four. That phase four, that's your resting potential. But you do see a depolarization occurring at rest. Part of that is calcium, and part of that, or most of that, is that funny current. It's Low leakage of sodium coming in through those channels to allow for that slight incline in the diastolic depolarization. Phase four, by definition, is two phase rest. But during rest, these cells are actually slowly creeping up. Once they get to threshold, that's when the other type of calcium channel opens. So we're looking mainly at heat. Okay. Heat type calcium channels again are have the probability of being <coughs> somewhere between negative 80 and negative 20 millivolts. Your L type calcium channels will open around negative 40, negative 30 until positive. Okay, so once you get up high enough, then you can open those L-type calcium channels. Not all of them are going to open at the same rate, but once you get one of them to trigger to open, calcium will come in, that's more positive charge, which further depolarizes and basically spreads the ability to open it. So this is what you would typically see for your slow pacemaker cells. This is looking at the SA nodes specifically. That zero upshoot. Is due because due to the calcium, not due at all. To sodium. <laughs> Sodium's role here is restricted to that diastolic depolarization, that slow and steady increase, in the slow pet phase. Four. Calcium is the job for that upshoot, and then calcium, like it always is, is responsible. Now to compare that to what we already saw for restricted. <coughs> Now we're looking at still the involvement of sodium, but it's a different type. These are your fast voltage gated sodium channels that means you have to get up to its threshold before it opens and then rapidly ends. So it's a very fast influx of sodium, which is different than that slow leakage you find in those funny curves. It also shows. Relative, effective, or absolute. It should actually. This one came from the Warren book, but technically it's more of an absolute structure here. The effective, as I said before, that that transition. Sorry, 
For what? Oh, so that it goes down to about negative sixty. So it's still less negative than one particular muscle. That's its resting potential, and that's the starting point of that slow and steady. Is it always the same sixty It can it can fluctuate, and it'll fluctuate based on you know individual cells. It'll fluctuate based on compression levels of channels that exist, but it'll also fluctuate based on people. So negative sixty is sort of your average. Most of the numbers that we're talking about are not hard and fast. They are average numbers. And what you're really looking for is, for an individual, how does it change? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's actually the end of this lecture. It's all about how sympathetic I'm going to wait. OK. So this is just another figure that runs through the directionality of what is happening for electrical current flow in the heart. The reason that we care about this directionality is because, as I said before, you have more than one pacemaker inside of you. The timing of the discharge of these pacemakers is going to indicate which one of them controls the heart rate. So, there's one question related to uh, what we just talked about. Um, I'll, the question is just ask the question to change the result of clothing. We'll give you an increase. So, looking at this slow wave, which one of these is responsible for increase? So our options are looking at more negative threshold for activation based on this figure. If you had, um, if you had a more negative threshold, what does that mean for the shape of this? Where would you start? Where would it? What would it affect? It would affect the slope of what? How would it? It would, so for the so I'm talking about the, the threshold, not a decrease of the That was for the threshold. You decrease the threshold to activate those calcium. Where do calcium channels come from? The upshoot. So we're looking at phase zero. If you make the threshold more negative, are you going to reach that threshold to help with a faster flow? Okay, so basically, I'm not sure if I can see the but what you're effectively doing is let's say that you make the threshold instead of making it here, you make it here. Now, you've hit threshold sooner at this constant slope, and you'll get an action. Okay, so 
But that's how this would increase your overall heart rate. What if you started at a more negative diastolic? A more negative diastolic value. Let's say you started down here. Same slope. It's going to run parallel here. It's going to take longer. So it's actually going to slow down. Last one is a decrease in the slope of the pacemaker potential. You're starting at the same point. What happens if the slope is less? It's going to be a little bit more flat. It's going to take longer for you to get to the threshold because you can get that. How would you change the channels? The channels are governed by how the pain sense is connected to um, voltage. Right? So they're going to open other different voltage triggers. It is due to carbonation, right? The presence of carbonation of the residues inside of the actual protein cell that will cause it to change the channel. Now, if that is something That's not something that's going to change. What you're really going to change is you're going to change the, um, the overall activity of those channels, not by changing the ability to open up the You're going to just change the activity by the reflection of the And how, how can you do that? Anybody want to help them? How, how can you modify a protein? How can you modify a protein? You can add something to it, phosphate group. You can add methylation, right? Acetylation groups to all these different proteins in order to stimulate or silence. So that's actually where we get into the sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation to phosphorylate different targets based on elevated or decreased You can activate, um, you can basically upregulate or downregulate the expression of the number of channels. So with parasympathetic, you actually increase the expression of Channels, and you decrease the expression of the targeting of the toxin. Sympathetic system through the beta adrenergic will elevate the LDP, which is actually going to be not only phosphorylate the stuff we talked about, it's also going to phosphorylate those funny current channels to allow them to increase the So it'll speed up specifically acting on the SA node because that's the only thing. It is. No, it's passive. It's, it's just a channel. So any channel that we're talking about, the only decision that you make about movement in terms of direction is based on electrical gradient. So if you have sodium outside the cell, calcium outside the cell, basically your sodium is going to be in because a certain number of these channels are going to be open at the rest of the cell. Just the kinetics of that channel itself, a percentage of them are going to be open. You can increase the number of them that are open by phosphorylating them. Yeah, so it's the, the gradient. It has, to, it has nothing to do with what your voltage is except for the fact that you're making it more negative. So you are enhancing the negative draw of sodium. So in theory, you are increasing the thickness of it, but you do have to think about how many channels are open. So there will be a massive flux of how many channels are open. All right. Okay, so somebody. Last time I think asked about the T wave being positive. 
So this figure, I think this is from Guyton, walks you through um, looking at the thread of how that signal is going to come from depolarizing the SA node and spread down into the heart. So starting at the SA node, it will spread through the atria and into the AV node. It will go down the interventricular septum, and it'll spread through the bundle of hiss, the one part right um, distal to that AV node, and then it will spread out into the right and left bundle branches. And once it spreads out through there, it will radiate around through the Purkinje system. This is the part that will answer. When you are depolarizing the ventricle, you are depolarizing from the endocardium to the epicardium. And that is what we're looking at here. Endo, and then myo, and then epi. Okay. So this is how you are depolarizing from the inside out. When you repolarize, you repolarize from the outside. Because the repolarization current is going in the opposite direction that the depolarization current is. They both show a positive curve on that ECG. Because the ECG is measuring current flow, just overall measurement of current flow in one direction based on where you are. Okay? So because you start in the endocardium and you go out to the epicardium, that means that you have that positive flux. Repolarization should be a negative flux if it followed that same endo to epi pathway. It doesn't go to epi. That's why that T wave also shows that positive. Okay. After it spreads down, it will radiate up and depolarize the entire ventricle. All right. Um, I think I've showed it. We'll actually show the spread of current as it relates to the ECG. I'll show that to you on the next slide. So this one, this is sort of just a drawing apart to show you what the basic timing is for the arrival of that action potential that initiates at the SA node. So if we are starting here, that's going to be your zero point. It takes three hundredths of a second for that impulse to get from the SA node through the atrium to the AV. It's actually very fast. But there's a delay of a little less than a tenth of a second at the AV node. It takes time for that signal to get through that fiber string. Not the fiber string. For another reason. It will take time for it to get through that sort of bottleneck to allow it to pass down through the bundle branches and into the interventricular. So you have this delay. It takes 0 0.03 to get there, but it's this relationship between here to here. That's the delay. There's a delay between arrival at the AV node and arrival at the AV node. Okay, so the bundle of his is not going to receive it right after the AV node does. It takes a little bit of time for it to be <coughs> So some of it is insulation, you have it just going through one pathway to get into But there's another reason. The fibers that are in your AV node are anatomically different. They are narrower, which means they have a higher resistance. Because they're narrower and have that higher resistance, it takes longer for that current to be able to get. Right? Higher resistance means slower. Well, the other thing is, part of the reason why it takes a little bit longer is not just the fact that the fibers are a little bit more narrow, they also have fewer gap junctions. If they have fewer gap junctions, there are fewer low resistance pathways between.
between neighboring cells to allow them to polarize and spread that The biological effect is giving the heart enough time from contraction of the atria to completely fill the ventricles with blood before the ventricles. That's a biological or physiological effect of the time delay due to the It's at the nose. So not only is it surrounded by that fibrous ring to prevent atria from stimulating the ventricles directly, but you have narrower fibers in the AV node that have fewer gap functions. So much more resistance, slower current flow, and so on. So our sinus node, our sinoatrial node, normally has a discharge rate of about 70 to 80 per minute. It can be ramped up for the sympathetic stimulation to get up to 180 to 20 per minute. But normal discharge rate, we're looking at 70 to 80. So a little bit angry, a little high. But typically, it's going to discharge faster than the AV node, which will give you about 40 to 60. If left to auto stimulate. The Purkinje system is 15 to 40 feet per minute. So looking at each one of these, if each one of these were your pacemaker, this would be your heart rate. Okay, the reason the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart is just because it discharges faster. If you have an issue with the SA node not discharging before the AV node kicks into play, now you have an ectopic. Ectopic just means outside of the normal. Okay, so uh, you might have heard of ectopic pregnancy. It specifically refers to a pregnancy that is not within the uterine line of duration. It would happen maybe in the flow. It goes outside of the normal cycle. An ectopic pacemaker could be at your AV node, it could be at your contingency. <coughs> the biggest difference is what that does to overall heart rate if your sinoatrial node is no longer governing the rate. It also means that you are going to simulate <clears throat> from a different site, so you will not have that coordinated contraction because you're simulating lower in the system. That current's going to spread in both directions. The current's going to spread in both directions. The reason it typically spreads in one direction is because you're starting from up here and it's spreading down there. You're starting from sort of one end of the heart. But if you were to start in the middle, you can have it radiating back up, and then you start to lose that coordinated contraction. So, fastest discharge rate is the reason why your SA node is the pacemaker of your heart. So, what happens if that doesn't work? What happens? You can get some of this through uh, an AV node block. An AV block would be there's a problem with your atrioventricular node allowing current from the sinus coming in to the ventricle, to the system. So if the AV node basically shuts down all current coming from the SA node, your atria are going to contract more. You're still going to get the signal from the SA node, but your ventricles are going to be weak. What's going to happen then? What happens if no current gets through that AV? Yeah, to maintain blood flow. So you will get an ectopic pacemaker in the Purkinje system. It will continue <coughs> to play and start to contract. The problem is, the Purkinje system will only auto stimulate itself every 15, 40, 20 minutes. You're drastically reducing the ventricular heart rate. And basically, your atria and your ventricles are going to be. Okay? There is one other thing that happens very quickly. It takes a second for that to kick in. Okay, so if you have an AV block and your Purkinje system is going to kick in and start to become pacemaker to your ventricles, there's a delay because basically it's used to constantly being stimulated before it has a chance to stimulate itself. So it can take five to 30 seconds before the Purkinje system actually starts to stimulate itself. Because of that, you can tap out because of lack of cerebral blood flow during that time that your ventricles stop. That's called Stokes Adams syndrome. It's that point where the Stingy system, which is constantly being 
stimulated by something else, by your AV muscle, now has to just rely on its auto. <coughs> No. Um, so, yes, for the part of the heart that it affects, in theory. But don't forget that when you have an AV bundle block, unless it's a bilateral one, you're only blocking one side, and all of your ventricles are still going to be linked together electrically. So you could still have a signal coming down. Let's say you have a right bundle block. It could still come down through the left bundle branch and spread. It'll just spread in different directions. So it's coming, radiating up the side. It'll all come down on one side and then it'll have to spread. So it'll take a little bit longer, but you still get deep. If you have a complete AV block, then you don't get any stimulus coming through the AV nodes on the end. Yeah. yeah, in theory, if you if as long as you I would have to say it would be a little bit higher up, just distal of the AV node, because if you get down into the bundle of this. You can still radiate out the electrical pump. So it would, it would really have to be right after. Yes, Um, so, you can, not, no. <laughs> it's not sustainable long term. You're looking at anywhere from 15 to 40, so at best you're getting 40 meters of measurement going to the body. So, no, it's not, that's, that's something you need to, you need to go wrong. And you will know something's wrong because chances are you're going to pass out the line to your blood flow that's going to be And most likely the one doing it. this figure, but now I just want to walk you through some examples of what happens under each condition. Parasympathetic effects on the heart, your vagal nerves are going to innervate the SA node and the AV junctional fibers right above the AV node. Typically, vagus is going to have an effect on the atrium, so it can have a role to slow down your overall, overall heart rate. As I said before, it's going to increase your potassium permeability in response to the acetylcholine. And what that does is if it slows it down too much, you can get ventricular escape. Ventricular escape is what we just talked about. When the heart rate stops and it goes down, and then the continuous symptoms begin to play, that's when you see the ventricles escape being stopped and picked up their own rate. So if you slow it down too much, if you have excessive parasympathetic then you can end up with ventricular escape. And this is the last slide, which is your sympathetic side. We're looking at norepinephrine from sympathetic endings, who also can have an effect with epinephrine. They're going to increase the rate at which sinus nodes discharge because that beta 1 antinergic receptor is going to be activated to elevate cyclic P, which will phosphorylate all the targets we talked about, as well as the funny current signal in your patient. Because of that, it's going to increase the rate of conduction and also increase the force because it's elevating for <coughs> the amount of calcium rate of All right, I will see you guys on Tuesday.